Hi. So my name is Beth, and I love food, like a lot, a lot. And so I wanted to share um, kind of my natural progression of where I've come from and where I'm at today in hopes that it will be helpful for you. So for, for me, I grew up in a home where food was both feared and revered. And I, I struggled throughout my childhood, teen years, college, mom, today, like basically all my life with my body. And it's interesting because I find for so many others, myself included, that your relationship with food and your body is like this. It's so intertwined, right? So when I was younger, like I nailed it. <laughs> While I was younger, I remember feeling like such a failure because I wasn't anorexic or bulimic, and I attributed that to um, my fault of loving food too much. And really, I can kind of attribute my love of food to essentially saving me long term. But what I did struggle with, looking back now, is with orthorexic tendencies and binging behaviors. And so, um, just really brief. And super simplified definition of orthorexia is an unhealthy obsession with being healthy. And quite often, um, there's like some morality tied in there with food. So what that looked like for me is that I would be so worried, so terrified of eating something bad or unhealthy that I wouldn't eat because not eating was better than eating junk, right? Raise your hand if that's you. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one that has thought that way. Eventually, my body would respond to that type of restriction, and I would end up eating anything and everything until I felt sick, physically unwell. But more than that is that I would be plagued with thoughts and feelings of, you know, being a failure, but being terrified that I was going to die of cancer because I ate a bag of chips. Or even worse, that I was somehow less worthy, less righteous, as if I committed a grievous sin because I ate a donut. And so that just meant I would try harder, eat healthier, do better, and that cycle would perpetuate itself. And it really wasn't until a few years ago when I had an opportunity to help out at a retreat for women with food. I was really excited because I love, I love food. And so I helped um, plan the meals, prep the food, cook it, serve it. It was great. And it was there that my entire food paradigm shifted. Essentially, I was getting ready for our next meal, our last meal together actually. And I was reflecting on some of the comments that I'd heard from these women, which was, oh, this food is so healthy, it's so great, so high vibe, you know, great, beautiful comments. And it was like, yes, yay, because <laughs> that was my intention. But I started to feel uncomfortable, unsettled, um, and a random idea popped into my head. And it was, what if instead of feeding them healthy oatmeal for breakfast, which was what my original plan was, what if instead you fed them cold cereal? And I was like, oh, what? Excuse me? <laughs> and that thought terrified me because, one, I was still struggling, you know, the idea of eating something unhealthy because I'm not talking cashew granola. I'm, I'm talking like cinnamon toast crunch. Lucky Charms cold cereal, okay? So the idea of eating an unhealthy cereal for breakfast was like, I couldn't do that. And the idea of standing up in front of other women who were health conscientious and saying, hey, eat this, was, it was horrifying. But in the middle of this panic attack, I learned something that shook me to my core. And it changed everything for me and how I relate to food nowadays. And the quietest but most powerful voice came to me, um, which makes me sound a little crazy, but it was just, it was a prompting, basically. I felt it more than I heard it. Um, but it said, there is no good food or bad food. There's just food, Beth. Just like there's no good body, bad body, there's just bodies. And the way we judge our food is synonymous with the way we judge ourselves. And in that moment, I realized that all those years of following, of subscribing to these food beliefs, these food, food rules, and trying to control what I was eating, I was essentially trying to save myself, save myself, my clients, my children, 
and as a Christian, um, I realize some some important some important things that I had forgotten, which was um, I had forgotten who I am, why I'm here, and where I'm going. I had in all those years of using food to control and trying to be perfect, I had forgotten that I am a child of God. That no matter what I eat or don't eat, that will never change. Two, that um, again, I believe that I am here to learn and to grow, to become more like my heavenly parents. My sole purpose, my life mission is not to lose weight and be healthy. It's not, that's not why I'm here. And three, I realized that um, I'd forgotten, again, this is my own personal religious belief that through Christ's atonement, I can return home to live with my family forever. And there's no amount of clean eating that will satisfy those spiritual cravings. There's no perfect diet that will qualify me for heaven. <laughs> and so that kind of reawakening, remembering those three truths um, of who, who I am, why I'm here and where I'm going and how that relates to food, it just, it changed everything for me. And that's something that I try to uh, teach and share often with others. Now you don't have to be Christian. It doesn't matter. Um, but getting in touch and identifying what those truths are for you, um, of who you really are, not who the world tells you who you are, but who you really are and who you identify as, um, whether it's with your higher self, your greater source of wisdom, the universe, it doesn't matter, but really getting clear on who you are, why you're here and where you're going. And I choose to do this um, in part with food. And I have this really fun activity where, um, oh, here it is. It's a worksheet. And I have you sit down and take a moment and really get clear on who you are and identify what values speak to you, what resonates with you as truth. And you get to own it, you get to claim it. You're like, yes, that's me. And then you get to write it out on your paper plate. And then you get to sprinkle some cereal <laughs> or any kind of food, really. And you get to internalize, ingest these values as your truth. And the way that feels in your body is so much different, so much just expansive than good food, bad food. Because as I taught those women at the retreat, I loved, I loved the food I was making. I loved them and that's what they were eating. That's what they were resonating with. And just like if you've ever heard about the love rice, hate rice experiment, where you cook up a batch of rice, you put it in one jar, one jar, you say nice things to one, you say mean things to the other. And at the end of like a week or two, you know, that love rice is beautiful. It's white and fluffy. And that hate rice is a nasty jar of mush. Now you would never eat, you never eat that because that's gross, right? <laughs> But we do that on a daily basis, all the time, all the time. This is bad. This is fattening. This is unhealthy, right? And then we eat that. That damage is already done, and that's what we are internalizing. So I'm inviting you to change your story. You get to choose who you are. You get to choose what your food means for you because food has meaning. It's more than just fuel. It's an experience. Um, and I could go off on this forever. But I'm going to leave this with you now. If you're interested in this worksheet, let me know. I will gladly send you the printable. If you have questions about anything else I do and how I can help you, let me know. And I would love to support you because you're not alone and you are always enough. No matter what you eat or don't eat, that will never change. So I, I leave that with you. Namaste, fellow eaters. And have a lovely, beautiful rest of the day, evening whatever. And just give yourself some love, give your food some love, give yourself some love. And there you go.